In today's episode, I speak to Rona Lewis about purposeful play and its role in increasing engagement and productivity in companies. We discuss the concept of purposeful play and how it can be applied in training courses and the importance of building trust and psychological safety in teams through play and games. Tune in to today's conversation where we discuss the importance of finding joy and fulfilment outside of work. I create clear thinking and decisive leaders who can amplify their influence. Contact me to find out how I can help you or your organisation. And today our guest is Rona Lewis. How are you doing, Rona? I'm fantastic, Judith. How are you? I am brilliant. I am. (laughs) But first of all, tell me why you are fantastic. Well, you know, I, I always believe that we we really need to believe that we are happy and, you know, happiness and feeling good comes from inside. You know, uh, I think Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make me feel bad without my permission. Mm. And I just choose to be happy most of the time. You know, I'm human. I have my, my moments and I just I'm 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 just grateful every day for what I have and the fact that most people are negative and look at what they don't have is a shame, you know. Mm. So I wake up, I'm feeling great and crappy things may happen, but overall, I have a roof over my head, I have a great job, I have a wonderful dog, I have friends, I'm fantastic. And what dog do you have? I have a border collie mix. He's a border collie, chow chow, and I think flat coated retriever. He's a little bit of everything, but he looks like a border collie. He's 11. His name is Roscoe. He's great. Roscoe definitely sounds quite interesting. <laughs> he is. He's super fun. I love animals. So tell me more about you besides Roscoe. Well, I am the co founder and CEO of a company called Playful Mind Project. I call myself a play, um, well, I'm a play facilitator, but I'm really a play instigator where I work with companies, um, managers, teams to focus on positive psychology, brainstorming, innovative thinking, psychological safety, all the things that companies need to push themselves forward to increase profits. Hmm. Okay. So I am curious. Yeah. So what exactly is purposeful play and how does that work in terms of engagement and productivity? Well, when you think of the word play, Judith, what do you think of? I'm thinking of children and giggling and amusement. Okay. Excellent. Now, when you think of your inner child, how often does the inner child come out? Uh, quite a lot for me, actually. Excellent. Okay. Now, <laughs> think about people at work. How often do you think their inner child comes out? Not often because right. most workplaces kind of squeeze that out, don't they? Exactly. And play at work is a little bit different than Play just for play's sake, which, of course, is always important because it keeps you in the present moment. They have a parallel because when you play, you are in a better mood. You are in the present moment. You're having fun. You're not judging. You're in that childlike mind. Well, purposeful play takes that positive mindset and brings it into the workplace and makes it makes a purpose for what you what you're doing there's a method to the madness if a team needs a little bit more help with their with their bonding because they are remote or or hybrid or everyone's new or there's a lot of change going on we come in and we offer programs where we get people to talk to each other and in better moods and trusting each other Psychological safety is the basis for all of this, and that includes emotional intelligence, critical thinking, and all of this can come forward with purposeful and attuned play. When you attune to people, you 
meet them where they are emotionally, physically, psychologically, all those things. And combining them allows people to learn better. Stop to think about it, Judith. People learn better when they're more open and, and having fun, right? When was the last time you were cranky and were really able to, to take in new information, you know? <laughs> and so when, when we give people exercises, activities, I'm always hesitant to use the word game. You know, people talk about gamification a lot and gamification is great. Gamification is not the same thing as play. You will play games. And a lot of times when you gamify a way of learning, you have to do it for whatever reason. Well, that's called forced fun. Mm. And we don't want forced fun because if someone, you know, for me, if someone says, oh, we're go, everyone's going out and going to karaoke. I would, I would be miserable. I do not like karaoke. I can sing on key. I just don't like it. Yeah. And so I would be miserable. Well, that's not playing. You know, you have to, so you, you have to tune to them, meet people where they are. And if they don't like the game that they're playing, how else can you get them involved in whatever you're doing, whatever you're learning? So they have elements that run into each other and there is a big difference. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I have a question. Sure. So how, so I see play mm -hmm. as unstructured and spontaneous or in the sense that it just happens. And yet and you it, talk about purposeful play. So how does that work? Well, if if you think about play, when people are on a, when, when kids even are on a playground, that playground is your parameter. Okay. That's, that's, that's where you are. Everything, even spontaneous play has parameters. Stop to think about when you're playing tag. You remember when you were, you know, yep. or pin the tail on a donkey, anything. These, there are rules within that spontaneous game. So there is structure in, in everything, even in improv. And we do a lot of improv things with, with our, uh, with our uh, programs. So the world is a playground. If you stop to think about it like that, and there are parameters. So let's say, all right, we're in the office and we are, you know, we'll, we'll do a fun photo contest. Whoops. And so that that means that you have to go around and find a picture of something with polka dots just to say well the parameter is the office so there no matter where you are your playground and the rules within it is a are, are parameters for that play whether it's spontaneous okay. or planned so Thank you for that. So I'm just sure. thinking now, because I know that you come in and you do customized program. Yeah. And I'm wondering how do you deal with people who may well be quite playful, mm -hmm. but don't but don't like playing that doesn't seem to have a point. Well, you, purposeful give play. Me an example what, in what yeah. I mean. Sure. So I'm just sort of thinking because sometimes you can go on training courses. Uh -huh. and you're there to learn something whatever it is and then the facilitator have you uh playing a game that seems to have no bearing on what you're there to learn uh -huh. it's just like a game for the sake of a game and for some people that's annoying because it's pointless whereas if they had organized a game that was fulfilling the purpose of why you were there, then mm -hmm. that would be okay. Okay. Well, I would say, first of all, and hopefully I'm not throwing too many people under the bus. If okay. the facilitator is not explaining why, at least in, in the debrief, why an activity is done, then they're not very good. 
usually <laughs> you at least get even for um, an icebreaker or an ice warmer, as it's sometimes called, because icebreaker, the icebreaker word can be harsh, you know, even if there's a, a warm up that gets your mind thinking differently, that's that's usually what the seemingly innocuous activities are uh are, are, are done. They're, they're done to just kind of change, change the way your brain is thinking. Usually when we're at, at work, we're mm -hmm. a little bit more left brain with, you know, facts, figures, Excel sheets, everything's black and white sort of thing. Whereas the more intuitive side, which is the left brain thinking tends to be a, a, rather the right brain thinking is a little more creative and it's hard to go uh, from one thing to another without kind of a uh, an uh, something that takes you there gently, you know, and mm -hmm. that's that's a lot of times what what something is what a, an activity or a game for this is 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 done for. So it may seem like it doesn't make sense. And there should be a purpose. See what I did there? I brought it back to purposeful play. There is <laughs> there's a purpose for it. It's to get you warmed up. It's to get you talking to people or thinking in a certain way. 98.76% of the time, I just made that number up, but it's an awful lot. Most of the time, there is a reason for the facilitated activities that um, a workshop leader is giving you. Yeah. You and- know Oh. I'm, uh, uh, just let me let me add this. Sometimes someone really doesn't want to do it, mm. and that's all okay. Again, we go back to that forced fun. There are ways to get people involved. The other day, I gave a program for the public sector, Southern California Public Sector uh, HR Association. So it was all of Southern California, and. Afterwards, uh, you know, I was, uh, people came up to me and were asking me all kinds of, of questions. And I had a few who were like, well, this person, they've been there for a long time. They're not into change and we're trying to do this. And this is what I suggested. And it was kind of an epiphany for them. I said, you know, there are more ways to get people involved in the activity than just having them do it or, or, or play it, get them to assist you. Have you, if, if you have kids, for anyone who's listening, if you have kids and you watch them play, sometimes there are kids who are a little bit shy. They don't want to do it. They're, they're standing on the sideline. And if you get them involved to, okay, you help me count this, this, and this, or if you help me make sure everyone is rounded up, if you give them something to do, it still gets them involved in the activity to their comfort level. And a lot of times the kids will look and see how much fun everyone else is having. And then they'll kind of dip their toe in and start to get into it and then want to play. Well, adults are the same way. So I suggested that these people give their, their reticent employees a task to get them involved in the activity, which may help you a little bit and still gets them involved enough that they are speaking to people where they become a little bit more comfortable. And then round two, they'll do something. They are at least involved in some way that opens them up to that play mode. That's a good tip. That's a good tip. Thank good. you for that. I think of course. What, I was, what I was thinking before was when we was talking about facilitators that bring in games that just end up annoying some people because they don't want to get involved, mm -hmm. it made me think about actually maybe the issue isn't the game. The issue is that they want to do the game without any trust or psychological safety being right. built in. Because I noticed that, I suppose, you know, if, if what you do for a living is is like designed to take these type, you know, these type of programs, you notice more when other people are doing it. And sometimes right. people have designed a program that requires a level of trust without having built it first. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, there's, um, and I, I, I certainly appreciate when managers and HR executives 
try these things to do, you know, team building and changing corporate culture, things like that. And they do what I call game spaghetti. They throw a bunch of, of games against the wall, hoping something sticks. Yeah. And they don't really have an understanding of the psychology behind it. And this is all science backed. You know, 20 years ago, people didn't understand storytelling in speech giving. No one did it until they realized that that's how they get buy-in. That's how people understood and can make the story and the, the, the lesson, whatever it is behind it, their own. This is what play is doing. It opens people up and they don't really understand it. And it's just at the, the edge. So people who are incorporating it are really at, at, at the cutting edge of this. And I so appreciate them giving it a shot. And at this point, perhaps it makes sense to bring in a play facilitator, a play consultant. And there are a bunch of us all around the world. Uh, I'm I'm a member of a uh, of a mastermind where there's there's probably about 25 of us who all work in the field of play for business in various ways. Hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Let's listen to a quick advert. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor, and trainer, and the leading authority on Maverick Leadership. She is the founder of the Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners, and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press. Welcome back to the Maverick Paradox. This is the podcast for the pathologically curious. You've said before that having a childlike, playful mindset is the secret source for psychological safety, which then leads to profits. Yeah. What do you mean? Tell me more about that. That sounds interesting. Well, you know, I just gave a talk, another talk um, about what, what psychological safety really is. And it's not, it's nothing in and of itself. You can't have psychological safety on your own because who are you feeling safe from? Mm -hmm. Psychological safety is all about teams. And Amy Edmondson, who is a, uh, she's the, uh, I think, head of the leadership. I can't remember. Oh, she, I think she's a professor of, of leadership at Harvard Business School. And she is one of the, the leaning, leading voices for psychological safety. And it's, it's, it's all about teams, you know, it's, it's team psychological safety. You can't have psychological safety unless you also have emotional intelligence from your leaders and critical thinking. So it's a, it's kind of a house of, of cards. And if you don't have one of the triangle, I call it the Holy Trinity and I spell it W H O L E dash Y it's it's impossible to have psychological safety when you are open when you ha- when you go into a meeting with your employees as a leader with the spirit of adventure and fun and and joy and willingness to hear other people's opinions that's that's empathy that's high emotional intelligence leaders have to show this because employees will react and mimic the actions of their their managers and leaders. So that's where that comes in and and all ties in for that psychological safety. When they know that their ideas are accepted without judgment and without criticism, because they are open and because, hey, let's see what you have, that makes it all, you know, all the more fun. People enjoy each other more. They're more willing to accept feedback and throw out ideas that may be a little off the wall. And we don't know. Let's give it a shot. Hmm. You know, um, there's a there's a great story. Ben and Jerry's ice cream out of Vermont 
has a big campus and they have an ice cream graveyard. It's literally a piece of the campus where they, uh, because they allow their people to try ice cream flavors of all different kinds, you know, let's try this Jamocha almond broccoli ice cream. And so people, they will, they will try it. And if it doesn't work or if it go, if they decide to put it for sale and it doesn't do anything, they literally make a gravestone for it and put a little haiku or, or poem. And that's, that's their way of saying, Hey, we gave it a shot. Didn't work. So it's in the graveyard. And I just think it's a brilliant way to allow people to try new things without throwing them under the bus or making it a harsh criticism if something doesn't work. Isn't that cool? It is actually. It's kind of funny in a way, isn't it? Yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah, I think every company should allow for that. And I, I believe it's 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 good. It's either Google or Yahoo. Maybe it's it's Google. They have an 80-20 rule. 80% of the time you have to work on things or you need to, you know, to work on what you were hired for. And 20% of the time, go play on a project that you really want to try. Yeah, I think that's kind of, it, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Um, in the sense that it's a, what you're actually doing is finding a way to make somebody's current job more interesting. So they stay yeah. engaged. Um. But the way it's marketing is kind of the the opposite, isn't it? It's like saying, um, if you're not enjoying your job, that's okay because you're going to have some time off from your actual job to do something else. Well, yeah. And there are, you know, you don't have to, I don't necessarily believe that people have to work their passion or have their passion as work. You have to, I would say, you have to at least like your job and then get a hobby that you really enjoy doing. Find something creative that keeps your mind happy. I have a good friend who is a CFO for hire. She has a, a company that, that does that. And to work the other side of her brain, to keep her, her brain a little bit more creative, she designs jewelry. Totally different headspace. And she doesn't do it every day. She maybe does it one or two days over the weekend. And it keeps her sane. You know, it's it's that that feeling, you know, when you go to a really good movie and you come out and you're talking about it with your friends and everybody's in a great mood and that lasts a few days. That's what having a playful hobby does for you. It makes a lot of sense because I think it's a bit... It's it's unrealistic to expect a job to fulfill hundred percent of your needs. Exactly, you know. Unless and I suppose you work for yourself and you've designed it that way, and in which case that's bliss. Yes, and I am I am still designing mine. There's there's a lot of minutia that I can't stand, and there's not a, there aren't a lot of us working at the at the company, so. A lot of us have to, you know, we have to wear a lot of different hats and sometimes it kind of sucks and, and you have to see the bigger picture and, you know, this is helping me do what I love. So I'm going to do this because that's one step closer to whatever it is that I like doing, you know, and if you are able to see it in that, that light, what's the positive spin, you know, how do you make lemonade out of these lemons? And that's all about positive psychology and flipping your mindset, which is part of play as well. Yeah. So is there a process that people can follow to make stuff more playful, but purposeful? Well, I would say first, the first thing is go inward a little bit. You know, think about when are you happy? What makes you happy? And or what what brings you joy besides, you know, Marie Kondo's going through the your your house and holding things and seeing how you feel. You know what? Uh, for me, the beach makes me happy. I live close to the to the beach. So even going and taking a walk or a run or sitting and meditating on the beach, that is my happy place. So something as simple as going out in nature. I also love to color and I love doing artwork. Uh, I, I cook a lot. 
It's another form of being creative. So that brings me joy. And especially I love cooking for other other people. So think about things like that and that that feeling that it 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 gives you and try to bring that up throughout the day. If you're doing something that you really don't like, all right, how can I flip this? Why am I doing this? What can I get out of this that will make me happy? What's the big picture? So when you start thinking about the good stuff, you will start to feel better and it becomes a habit. You know, society is trained to look for the other shoe to drop. We're waiting for something crappy to happen, you know, and it's unfortunate. And we are in right now, we are in a state of constant stress because of the news. I almost never listen to the news anymore because it's, you know, between well, the pandemic is is ending, but now and now there's 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 war and there's there's crazy politics here in the United States. And well, frankly, there's crazy politics all over. And, you know, the U.S. is so divisive now. Why can't we change the conversation and look at what we have in common? If we stop to think about it, most of the things we complain about are first world problems. How many times, uh, I mean, I know for me, I, I I love clothes, I love fashion, and I'll walk in and I have a closet full of, of clothes. And I'm like, oh my God, I have nothing to wear. When in fact, I have a ton of choices. I have bucket O shoes. Of course I have, you know, I my life is fantastic because I have a walk-in closet with all these things. Mm -hmm. Think about all the people who don't have that choice. What are you complaining about? Little things like that make a big difference. And, you know, even if you if you started the day, I, I journal almost every morning and I write down a few things that I'm grateful for. And that's very easy. It flips your mindset, makes you go inward, makes you present and just think, you know, oh, my God, I'm so glad I get to have this hot cup of, of coffee. I get to have a dog, you know, little things. And it's like, oh, my God, I take these things for granted. Um, don't, you know, be grateful for, for the little things. I so I would say, start with that. Thank you. It's like what you see on Facebook, when you see all these, all these videos of people that have been gifted those glasses that you can see color and just yeah. see how they react when they can see color for the first time. And yeah. It's just so humbling because either it's something you don't think about because you've always had color. So you don't really think about what does that actually mean? Yeah. If you're, um, before we finish, if you're a leader and you are thinking about how making the workplace, I guess, what would be the business case if you for making a workplace more playful? How would you convince your manager that by making things more playful, things will be better? Well, I think you first, first of all, you have to make sure that they are open to, to change. Mm -hmm. And it's all about questions. So, you know, how are things working so far and find their, find their pain? You know, it's, it's, are, are you happy with things are the way things are, are going? And I would, I would ask some, some questions to the leader. And then separately, I would ask some questions for their team because many times managers and leaders have no idea what their employees are really thinking. Mm. There's a big disconnect. And I find that more often than not, the leaders are, are just not connected to what's going on and how their people are feeling. And I think that's before you do anything, see what the issues are and, and then go backwards from, from there. All right. What do we need to do to change this? Is you know, are you willing, if, if, if I'm speaking to the leader, um, okay, what, you know, are you willing to take a chance? What's the risk of you not doing anything? What's going to happen if nothing changes? Well, if nothing changes, nothing's going to change. Uh -huh. How, you know, how bad is it? And so what, you know, let, let's try things on a trial basis. Do little things. 
you know, and I, I can't go specifics because I don't know if, is your team all remote? Is your team hybrid? Uh, you know, is it a large company? Is it a small company? There are so many variables that it's, it's hard to, to take that answer right away. I would say that it has to come from the top down, that, that willingness to take a chance on something new and ask, what's the worst thing that has ever happened when you have tried something new? And what happens, you know, what the, what kind of chance are you taking if you don't do anything? Will you become a blockbuster? Will you become Kodak or, you know, the companies that have gone by the wayside because they didn't change? Mm. Brilliant. That's a fantastic place to end. Rona, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, this was so much fun, Judith. I'm so glad we got to do this. And, you know, if anybody wants, has any questions or anything, they can, they can connect with me at playfulmindproject.com or ronalewis.com, R-O-N-A-L-E-W-I-S.com. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you out there for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I am Judith Germain, your host, and I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Rona as much as I enjoyed having it. As a leader, you know that having a strong level of influence is essential to achieving your goals. But how do you know if you're truly making an impact? Take the how influential are you scorecard to get a clear picture of your current level of influence and identify areas for improvement. With personalised recommendations and valuable strategies, you'll be able to amplify your influence and make a real difference as a leader. Don't miss this opportunity to improve your leadership skills. Take the scorecard now at amplifyyourinfluence.com dot score app dot com